Hi, it's Diane, and I'm very excited for my new book, Daily Meditations for Visionary Leaders. Check it out on my website, visionsapplied.com forward slash meditation. Now, on with the show. If you are listening to this podcast, it means you are searching. Searching for someone who understands you, someone who gets you. You are yearning to be understood and to belong. Welcome to the Someone Gets Me podcast, where we help smart, talented, and sensitive people navigate an often insensitive world. Let's welcome your host, ambassador, author, speaker, and mentor, Diane Allen. Diane has the experience and knowledge to educate and inspire as she has been there and understands your unique intensities and their challenges. Hey everybody, it's Diane again from Someone Gets Me. Obviously, you're listening to the podcast and I have this most amazing person that I'm interviewing today that I met and I think he is just the bomb. So you're going to be so excited about this interview because I have this man with me. His name is Jason Snyder. He lives in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. He's a Floridian like me, and he has some skills and abilities that will really help you moving your life forward, but most importantly, feeling understood and cared about and how to negotiate this crazy world in a way that really serves you. Jason is a coach who works with professional people, business leaders, Anybody who is seeking to really have a higher quality of life, he is inspiring, he is knowledgeable, he helps you by helping you learn neuro-linguistic programming, which I have been just attracted to for years, and he can help you just really master the perfect path for you so that all that inner great vision we talk about all the time, your inner goodness can show up and really bless the world. And if you ever get a chance to meet him live and, or see him on a Zoom call, you must do it. He has an amazing smile, bright eyes, and he's so passionate for helping everybody really live their life the way they're supposed to live it. So I want to welcome you to the show, Jason. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy Monday morning just to speak with us. So welcome. Yeah, thanks so much for having me and for that great introduction. I have so many questions for you, and I'm going to try to pare it down in a way that Hopefully it will work. But first of all, not everybody, I think, understands what neuro-linguistic programming is. It's a word I'm familiar with, but not everybody is. So could you give us just a little blurb about what it is so that people understand the platform that we're coming from in this show? Sure. So the simplest way, I think, to explain it is just to break it down word by word by word. So neuro-linguistic programming. So in a nutshell, it's about how your neurology neuro, and that includes your, your entire physiology, your whole nervous system, your body, basically, how that gets programmed through the softwares of the mind, the software coding of the mind. And so one of the genius geniuses of NLP was in recognizing that our software of our mind is coded using sensory based information. So just stuff we take in through our senses and then language. And so in understanding that everything you do, all of your patterns, all of your programs are all just governed about by what movies you're playing in your mind and how you're talking to yourself. Um, it really opens us up to do some really cool things in terms of communicating more effectively, unleashing our own inner potential, and also helping other people to unleash their potential that they have just clamoring inside. Oh, that's amazing. So really like we can also help ourselves and other people so if somebody is a ceo of a business or a leader or a teacher or somebody like that they can use the neuro linguistic programming tools to help them help their people right yeah and, and and so the way that i look at nlp and it's not the same way as everybody but i think that the most valuable way to use it is to apply it to yourself first hmm. um because like you're saying if you're a leader a manager a coach a teacher um you know, pretty much we're all communicating with people all the time. But the funny thing is, is that we think that if we, we're, we're trying to influence others in a certain way. But the funny thing is, is that we'll never have the flexibility to do that until we stretch ourselves first to have that capability. So yeah, so first we start with just how do we communicate with ourselves so that we can stretch ourselves so that we can be more effective in our relationship. Wow, that's awesome. So how did you find NLP and, and what attracted you to it? <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's kind of a funny story. So, 
So I actually found NLP just searching the internet. Um, a friend, uh, me and a couple of friends of mine, we went to this um, hypnosis show and the whole entire drive home, we were basically fighting over whether or not it was real. <laughs> and so uh, I went home and I started doing some research on the internet and I started reading some things and this, this thing called NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, kept on coming up and coming up. And so um, I ended up purchasing a, a course and immediately when I heard it, it was like uh, explosions went off in my brain. Like this is what I've been looking for my whole entire life. Um, and and it, that's kind of where my journey started. Oh, that is great. That's a great story. So someone, the name of the show is Someone Gets Me. So has ever ever been a time in your life where you looked around and nobody got you? <laughs> yeah, I can say that quite often. Probably more often than not, people don't get me. Um, <laughs> Yeah, you know, uh, so you're asking when, was there ever a time when people don't get me? Yes. Oh, yeah. Um, so one of, the, one of the cool things about, about NLP is that, well, when you understand how all this stuff works, it's, it's hilarious how really nobody gets anybody. I think that that's like one of my core understandings. As like an expert communicator who studied this stuff for over 10 years, what I found out is that nobody really get, we think we get people and people think that they get other people. But I think that's kind of more of a, an optical illusion in a way. And when you really dig down and ask the right questions and really sit down and authentically try to get to know somebody, you find out that they're not necessarily who you had perceived them to be, I guess. Right. I, I tell my clients all the time that we all think everybody is processing and communicating in the world the way we are, but the truth is nobody is. <laughs> yeah. Two people are doing it the same, no matter what we think, no matter how close we get to thinking that we've got it. You know, language is just a pointer that there's so many other levels and layers. And, and I think that's what you're saying. So it, it's kind of funny. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. I mean, everybody, everybody has their own, their own processing style, their own patterns. And, and like you said, no two people are the same. Ultimately what I, what I think people, can really benefit from doing is learning how to learning about yourself. So having that level of self-awareness to know what your patterns are and also learning about what the other possibilities are. What are those, those communication patterns or thinking patterns that the people who, who quote unquote, don't get you, how are they looking at the world? Because then we can stretch ourselves to communicate in a way that they understand just so that we're not speaking two different languages and, we can't expect them to change because, well, other people don't, don't really change, you know? Right. So really learning about how can we stretch ourselves to just, just like learning another language. You're trying to communicate with people who don't really speak your language. Right. Exactly. So what a lot of people who listen to this show struggle with procrastination mm -hmm. and sometimes the procrastination is fear of doing it right or whatever. And sometimes it's, what I call time optimism. Well, I can do it in half the time. So they wait till the last minute, then they stretch, then they pressure themselves and make a big mess. So are there any kind of tips or ideas that you could share with any of my procrastination people that maybe they could try not, you know, working with you directly in order to see, you know, something that might help them? Most definitely. Let me think. I've got a couple of things that, that come to mind here for procrastination. So one, one humorous thing, which I'm not going to say 100% is, uh, is my, my genuine answer here. But one funny thing is that if you're good at procrastinating, then one, the way we look at that in NLP is that that's a skill that you have. You are extremely skilled at procrastinating. So first of all, give yourself a high five, a pat on the back. Woo! That's, <laughs> yeah, that's an amazing skill. Not everybody can do that. If you, if you went up to a, you know, I have a friend of mine, if you went up to, if you went up to her and you told her that she had to wait until the last minute to do the thing, she would get so uncomfortable in her own skin. You know, she needs to get it done right now, right away. So good on you. You have an amazing skill that not everybody has to put stuff off. And so why not use that skill to just procrastinate on your procrastination? Ooh, there you go. You procrastinate later, right? You're really good at it. You know how to procrastinate. Why not just procrastinate later? You have plenty of, you're, you're good. You can do it faster than anybody else. Why not just wait until later? And then you can, you know, shove all the procrastination into, you know, five minutes instead of spreading it out over a couple of weeks. That's one thing. <laughs> and, and, and it's, it's said, you know, half jokingly because like it's, it's on one level, it's a joke, but honestly, it's a serious thing. You have the skill to procrastinate. Why not procrastinate on your procrastination and put it off till later? 
for something for something maybe a little more practical, um, you know, a lot of times procrastination comes from there's a couple of things. And one of the things that I think is very common is that people have a perfectionist mindset. And so they want things to be just right. And if they can't have it just right, then they're going to kind of put snooze on it, like pause it so that it's not, unless it's going to be perfect. And then it, and then they wait to the last minute and then they have an excuse because I waited to the last minute and that's why it's not perfect. And that's not the way that I would have envisioned it to be. One of the solutions I have to that is thinking about, thinking about the outputs that you put into the world in terms of a prototype mentality. So thinking about it as that this is just a, a first prototype and I'm going to get feedback on it before I put out the next thing, get feedback on it before I put out the next thing. And so when you look at things in terms of a prototype mindset rather than a perfectionist mindset, then you can put stuff out there, learn and actually approach that perfection rather than constantly putting it off on hold, putting it off on hold, putting it off on hold. I really like that. And, you know, I, I sit here hearing you going, well, it's two P words, you know, so you can actually just put it over here. But thinking about it as a prototype gives so much more room for expansion and ideas and an input your own and others instead of keeping, you know, I, when you said it, I even felt like less boxed. Yes. <laughs> so, and I think that's what happens with a lot of people is they get themselves in such a tight box that it's so miserable in there that it, it just stresses their whole system out when, and I like that the prototype gives so much flexibility because when you have somebody who's gifted and smart and sensitive and visionary, that it, it's all a prototype. Everything's the, the prototype to the next thing, you know? And so that's what Epcot stands for in Disney, right? Experimental prototype community of tomorrow. So there you go. That's a good fun, fun Florida fact for us. <laughs> yes, there it is. And so there's your Florida fact, everybody. <laughs> Um, being that Epcot's kind of between us, sort of. So that's interesting. Yeah, um, I really like that. That's neat. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, one, one last thing on that, if we have a little bit more time sure. um, for procrastination, is, is really, I think, accepting yourself as fallible. You know, when we're, when we're gifted people, we think of ourselves as we have this standard that we need to meet because we think highly of ourselves. Uh, other people uh, have expectations of us to perform at a certain level. And so really coming to grips and accepting our, your, your, your humanity, like your fallibility, that you make mistakes and that's totally okay. Making mistakes is actually the pathway to learning. There's nothing, nothing wrong with it. It's actually super beneficial to make mistakes so that you can continually get better and better and better. So just embracing your fallibility as a human being. That's a big one. I have some people that procrastinate that I'm working with and I don't know that they would admit it, but when they hear you say this on this podcast, <laughs> they're going to go, yeah, you know, I don't give myself any room to make mistakes that on some level they believe they have to be infallible mm -hmm. or else they're not good enough or they're not worthy enough and the pressure's on, you know, and so there's so many levels to that, giving yourself permission to be human, you know. And, and even that, that brings up another layer of it, which is, is, is really your self-esteem because gifted people, at least in my experience, tend to link their self-esteem with their output, with the behaviors and the output. It's like, I will, I'm good enough because I performed at a certain level. Mm -hmm. And as long as you play that game in your mind that I need to perform at a certain level in order to be valuable, that there's going to be times when your esteem is very, very high when you're putting out those outputs. And then there's going to be that roller coaster where you go up and down because your self-esteem is constantly riding on how well you've performed in any given situation. So separating that out and just valuing yourself unconditionally, recognizing that, look, babies are valuable and they can't uh, get a 1600 on their SATs or they can't, uh, you know, solve a Rubik's cube or they can't, even, you know, they can't even drive a car, walk on their feet, pay their bills. They can't do anything. And if a baby is valuable, regardless of whether or not they can perform at any level, you know, they can't even feed themselves, then why should, why, when does that change, I guess? Right. <laughs> at one point, you go, okay, I'm no longer valuable anymore. <laughs> right, exactly. And I think sometimes that shift happens because we start believing lies about ourselves fed to us from others. Mm -hmm. And and we make up stories in our head, you know, get, all people do it, but gifted people are known to do that. When the world's confusing when we're little, we just make up a story. And pretty soon, the plausible truth of it becomes such a reality, even if it's not even real. And so part of it is unpacking, like, where did 
I fill in the holes from an incomplete world and what's real just because somebody said something about me doesn't make it true. All of those things that when we're younger, if there's nobody there helping us moderate it, you know, we become adults and then pretty soon we're all either all about output or we're not sure, you know, that imposter syndrome piece There's so many things that show up when you dial back in, you see that it, it started because of errors somewhere along the line, you know, known and unknown on purpose and not on purpose. It's not about that. It's just about getting clear on it without judgment of ourselves, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Just, and that's, that's another, that's, that just ties in again with that embracing your fallibility as a person, you know, it's like there are, <laughs> you're not perfect. You're a human being. You're perfectly imperfect. If you're going to be perfect, uh, you're perfect in your imperfections, in your uniqueness and accepting that, embracing that, and even celebrating that is where, where you'll find the more fulfillment. You'll find actually higher levels of productivity and faster levels of growth. And, and you'll find that you fit in better with different, you'll, you'll find that you're more flexible to communicate with different groups of people, different types of people, which is just so, so enriching, I think, as, as human beings. So that brings up an interesting point. I just got goosebumps, so I know that it's important. The connection with other people. Mm -hmm. A lot of times people feel like they're isolated because nobody gets them. You know, they're like alone in the world. And so what you're saying is if you get flexible and you shift some of your communication paradigms, you're not going to be as lonely and isolated because you'll be able to engage with other people better. You know, it may not be perfect, but it's better, right? Mm -hmm. That then leads to kind of a more fluid connection to others. And one of the things that sensitive gifted people need to do is have multiple peer groups where they have lots of different people in their world so they can kind of tap in whatever resource is necessary and then be the resource too. It's that two-way street. So it seems that using NLP to help grow and stretch and kind of expand rather than using uniqueness to hole up and go within yeah. sounds like a really good solution and a good starting place for some somebody who might be feeling alone in the world or might not be seeing that hold on a second there's a different way to experience these things that gives me more freedom yeah i think yeah and, and it's it's like relying on your strengths it's like if you're really good at doing something and you keep on doing that doing that doing that you do that to the detriment of all these other things we get caught in it's it, it forms a really strong blind spot so yeah like you're saying it's when you can become more flexible in how you communicate with yourself and more, how you communicate with others, that, that it, yeah, it adds that, that richness to your life. It adds that richness, richness to be able to not only just see the world from a, a richer perspective than you, you know, that you, you know, instead of looking through those blinders, you can open it up and see the world from more a, a wider perspective. How do other people see the world? Uh, another uh, one of the, Great ways to do that is just by practicing asking questions, which I think that sometimes gifted people who always have that feeling that I need to be right or I need to know it all or I need to know everything, it limits us from, from being able to ask those questions, sometimes stupid questions, but well, we just don't understand. And, <laughs> and through asking questions is how we can understand other people and understand how they work and understand where they're coming from and connect more deeply. Right. And I have people that ask questions kind of like, you know, the old joke about lawyers, you only ask a question, you know, the answer to, or yeah. they ask the setup questions where it's a setup to get you to say what they want to hear versus really being open. So it's about, you know, ask better questions, you get better answers, you know, and, and be willing then to hear what comes back, you know, and listen to what the person says so you can actually expand you know, your own ability to see and understand things. That's great. I love it. Now I got another question. You ready? I have a bunch of people that listen to this show and also that I work with that really struggle with overthinking and overprocessing and analysis paralysis is the theme of their life to the point where with some of them, they really struggle with addictions, with depression, with real serious issues because it, they cannot get down below the top of their neck. I really believe that if there was, if they were open to really looking at the way they deal with the world in a mental paradigm structure, that they would get a lot of freedom and be able to see some solutions for the jams their overthinking has created. And I believe, you know, the little bit I know about NLP, that that is a really valuable tool, this, some of the things in it 
to help people who are smart, who know more than they need to know, you know, it's too smart for their britches and very sensitive at the same time and very aware and they learn very quickly. I believe that some of the things you teach and show people how to do would be really useful in that setting. Do you have any thoughts on that? Am I kind of on the right page? And if I am, anything you want to share about that piece of it? Yeah, definitely. And I think I th it's it's kind of funny because I think that people who are overthinkers would really be attracted to a field like NLP because it's a very analytical way of breaking down consciousness, breaking down uh, how is it that I or someone else is thinking about a certain situation that's causing them to respond in the way that they're responding. So it takes something that that seems kind of possibly mystical or esoteric or ungrounded and really grounds it into into really really solid structures as to how thinking somebody's thinking is working and and yeah what comes up for that a lot of times the that overthinking is actually so the reason why people overthink is because they're trying to find a solution to a certain problem they have a problem or some sort of a discomfort that they're trying to find a solution to and so they think about it and the thinking about it doesn't solve the problem so then they think about it more and they think about it more and they think about it more and then they think about their thoughts about it and they think about their thoughts about the thoughts about it and they think about it more and then they think about those thoughts and then and so it's funny because the initial solution of thinking about it at least the way that you're going about thinking about it it didn't work and so it's kind of like it's not working so what do we do well let's do more of it <laughs> maybe if we do more of it it'll work okay let's do more we need if it's not working we need to do more and more and more and more and more and so it's like a failed solution, initial failed solution that we're like repeating over and over again, trying to, it's that Einstein quote. It's like, if you try to solve a problem with the same type of thinking that created the problem, it's definitely not the Einstein quote, but good luck with that <laughs> because it's just not working. Um, and so, yeah, really being able to, in terms of like working with that, I think that it can really help to work with someone who has that perspective someone who can be outside of you and like a, a like an NLP practitioner such as myself or, or someone like Diane to step out and to just have have a sounding board of someone who understands thinking patterns to have them point out your blind spots to you or, or what your pattern is that you're doing that's not actually solving your initial problem but in terms of what you can do for yourself one of the things that I like to do is is a quote from a guy named Fritz Perls uh, who was a gestalt therapist one of the original therapists uh, that, that NLP was created by modeling what, what he did. And so one of his famous quotes is just to lose your mind and come to your senses. <laughs> like that. Lose, your, <laughs> lose yeah. your mind and come to your senses. <laughs> and, 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 you know, it's, it's so when you get into these thought loops, when we get into these thought loops where we're overthinking, thinking, 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 and we think that more thinking is going to solve the problem that the original thinking couldn't solve. And so we think about the thinking, about the thinking, about the thinking. One of the things you can always do is just to lose your mind, let go of all those thoughts and just come to the present moment with your senses. And that is the, the opposite of what you had been doing. You know, it's the opposite of overthinking something. It's just coming down to face value. And a lot of times that can help just to break the pattern at the very least to break the pattern, but also to really alter your state and to put yourself in a, in a state that will, that will possibly hold the solution, a different state, because the way you were going about it, what the solution wasn't there. I promise. <laughs> right. Cause if it was there, it, you wouldn't be in the analysis process. You would have sorted it out right in the beginning or yes. close to it. Right. And once you're thinking about the thoughts that are thinking about the thoughts, once you get two levels down, you're done, you know? So I have a question about the coming to your senses part. Cause I get, you know, I hear a lot of people says, well, you know, I'm not breathing. I can't breathe. I can't just calm down. Isn't it is I just tell me if I'm correct here. I'm not hundred percent sure, but it seems to me that coming to your senses means, okay, well maybe you can't focus on your breath cause you have whatever resistance, but it would be like, what do I see? What do I touch? What do I feel? And using all of your senses, like what kind of taste is in my mouth or anything to get in your body below your neck and let yeah. it in. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, it's it's really about just coming to the present moment because your thoughts there's so there's two there's two levels of reality at least well there's much more than two levels of reality but there's I, you can break reality into two categories you uh, subjective reality you can break it into sensory based experience that's where all primary reality comes from we take in how as human beings as human human uh, beings we interface with the world through our senses that's how we gather all of our information 
We take in information through our eyes. We take in information through our ears. We, we take in information through our, our, our nervous system, our feelers, our smells, our tastes. And so that is one level of reality. That's, that's the closest level of reality that we have to the actual world. You know, you could say the brown dog made a left turn. That's pretty, pretty sensory based and accurate. You can see that and you can describe that. Now there's another level of reality beyond that, which is where we start getting into evaluations and language and descriptives. So rather than the brown dog turn left, we can say the animal made a directional change. And which says pretty much nothing. We have no idea what that means. And even we can evaluate at that level. We could say the ugly dog mm -hmm. turned the wrong way. <laughs> right. And so there's a big difference between the ugly dog turned the wrong way than the brown dog made a left turn. And so when you come to your senses, you, you lose those evaluations. You can't be in that. You come down and it's just, what am I seeing right now? What am I hearing right now? Like you said, what am I tasting in my mouth right now? What do I... What do I feel on my skin right now? And when we go into that sensory-based reality, <clears throat> our evaluations melt away. We can't judge from that level. We can just observe. And so, in that time, and so in that time of observing, that's when we're in our senses, and that helps us come out of the analysis paralysis because you can't do both at the same time easily. Yeah, getting out of getting out of your story. And just stepping into what's going on right now. A lot of times, the analysis paralysis is, is you, you, what we call it a semantic reaction because you'll see someone having this like this very visceral, like this very strong physical response to nothing. <laughs> There's no actual trigger. All of the stuff that you're responding to in those moments is all in your head. None of it is tangible, real. You can't touch it. Right. It's just, it's, it's all in your imagination. You're just playing mental movies and you're playing, you're adding uh, commentaries on top of those movies that are causing you and you're commenting on the commentary even. And all of that is, it's, <laughs> none of that is real. So you, if you see someone or if you find yourself having a exorbitantly strong emotional or physical reaction to something, but that something is not presently in front of you, then you're probably overthinking. <laughs> 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 we would guess that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. And yeah. so coming to your senses, it is it's the exact opposite. You're not you it's it's about learning how to leave your thinking and learning to be in the present moment in reality, the the, the more objective reality. Um and that's a skill that I think that 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 well, if, you're, if your normal pattern is to be up in the clouds in your head inside, then the way we can unleash the most potential in you is to get you out of your head outside, because that's a potential that's clamoring inside of you that you just don't use that skill as much. And in being able to do both of those are two sides of the same coin, awareness outside and awareness inside, that, uh, or awareness in your senses versus awareness in your mind that when you can do both of those effectively, then you're using your, your, your mind-body system, your mind-body machinery to its full potential, rather than just practicing the skill that you're already good at to the, at the detriment of the other half of the potential of your nervous system. This really helps people balance themselves out. So if they're real heavy in the senses and not so much in the thinking and analysis or the other way, and they've kind of like, I'm, I'm imagining atrophy and I am I was at the gym this morning and there was this guy this guy with little chicken legs and a really built upper body and I thought he was going to tip over you know because he's not he's out of balance and so when you were saying that that I had this vision of this little chicken guy but it's like you know it, there's some there's a lot to be said for that kind of everything working together balance where you know we're not atrophying one big part of us to you know to make the other one bigger yeah, and, and then the, there's communicational consequences because if you have someone who's on the other side of the spectrum, you're not gonna, they're not gonna get, that's when you're gonna be like, they don't understand me. And it's partially that they don't understand you, it's also partially that you don't understand them because right. that way of being or thinking is so foreign. And so if you're not understanding them and they're not understanding you, you're also saying you don't understand yourself because you haven't developed both sides. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you're telling on yourself, right, on a, on a level. But I think for some people, we live in a society that is so reinforced for this whole mental construct thing that the being in the senses and being in the now and all that is left for the woo-woo people. Mm -hmm. And 
people don't realize that that's a vital important part for people that have high IQs, tons of mental machinery, that it's a valid neurological thing that is required for our balanced success. It's not just for the woo-woo people, you know? Yeah. Yeah, and even even people who are highly analytical, such as such as myself, you know, I, I resonate very well with your audience. One of the interesting things that I've learned since beginning to learn neurolinguistic programming and and the field of neurosemantics, which is my my specialty within NLP, is that all of these us, us gifted people, we're, we tend to be highly intuitive, so we tend to go inside and reflect and ascribe meaning to the things that are happening in the world. And as a gifted person, your, your um, meaning attributions that you give to the things at the events in the world are probably more accurate than some other people. Like you're making them up based on the data and you're doing these complex you know, uh, algorithms in your head to figure out what does it mean. And because you're gifted, that just means that you're right more often than you're not right. If you were wrong more often than you were right, you'd probably be psychotic or something. <laughs> you, 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 but because you're right more often than you're wrong, you're gifted. And so, but those, those algorithms and, and equations that you're running in your mind to figure out what does that actually mean, it, it's just that, it, it's just that, it's just your thinking about something. And it, it's, it's that, that's again, where this embracing your fallibility as a human being, understanding that you can make mistakes in how you analyze situations and that you're analyzing your, what are you analyzing when you're doing all this spinning in your mind? What is it that you're spinning around? Well, you're spinning around something that you took in through your senses. Right. That's that's, great. What, you're, that's what you're spinning around. Mm -hmm. And so when you can come back to what you're spinning around, you come back to the, the reality as opposed to your high, you know, a more objective reality as opposed to your highly subjective reality. That's brilliant. You used a word I'm not sure people understand, and I know it's your specialty, and you said about neurosemantics. Can you give us a little, I think people are getting a good clue of what neurolinguistic programming is. You're giving great examples that I like completely relate to, which means I know my audience is, right? And yeah. you mentioned neurosemantics, so that's your specialty within neurolinguistic programming. Give us a little flavor of that specialty. Yeah, so... I guess the difference between one of the major differences between neurolinguistic programming and one of the advances that neurosemantics adds on to it is that whereas neurolinguistic programming focuses mostly on these sensory based maps that I'm talking about, these sensory based models of the world where we just take in information from our senses and the way that we, excuse me, um, perceive the world in that way determines our responses. Neurosemantics focuses mostly on the thoughts about the thoughts, so the metacognitions. Uh, which actually end up being much more powerful than the primary level thoughts that we have. Because anytime you think about your thinking, it governs or it modulates the thought beneath it. For example, you have a situation where you have something due on Friday, let's say, to go back to the procrastination example. And now you think about that thing that's due on Friday and you, you, you think to yourself, Oh, that's going to be easy. Like I could totally do that if I wait until if I wait until Thursday night. That leaves me with us. That leaves me with like uh, five hours to prepare for it. If I don't sleep, I'll have eight hours, and uh, and I really only need like two hours. So you know, let's just wait until then. So there's a thought about that. Probably there's a thought in the back of your mind about that that goes, Yeah, you know what? That sounds really good. Let's do that. That's wonderful. That really sounds like a great idea. So the first thought was about the due date on Friday. It's going, oh, I can wait until the last minute. But the, there's a thought about I can wait until the last minute that goes, yeah, you know what? That sounds like a really good idea. And then there's even a thought about that thought that goes, yeah, we all like that in here. <laughs> but, you know, what happens if you go, if you had a different thought that goes, that goes, um, you know, you think about the same thought about the event, you know, the thing due on Friday. It's Thursday. You go, oh, yeah, you know what? I can wait until for the Thursday night, that's totally fine. But the thought about that thought, instead of being, yeah, that's awesome, good idea, is, well, you know what, actually, I tried that last time and maybe that didn't really work out so well, maybe I should do something differently. So notice that the thought about the thing being due on Friday is the same, but the thought about that thought is different, which totally changes your experience. And so this process is always going on in our minds. There's always thoughts behind the thoughts behind the thoughts. And the last thought tends to be very unconscious to us. We're not very aware of it. We feel it, but we don't necessarily, we can't really be so highly aware of it. And so neurosemantics teaches us to be aware of our thoughts about our thoughts about our thoughts, which is where we can find the leverage to actually change our, our patterning, our, our, our ways of being, our habits. 
So this would be a really effective way for somebody to start making really real, real transformation and real change in habitual thinking patterns that they may or may not be aware of, but that they can see are either causing a roadblock or a road jam or even negative consequences in their life. Like, like the bottleneck, like I can get so far and then I keep hitting a wall and I get so far and then I keep hitting a wall that there's something neurosemantic wise that keeps that train hitting the wall. And so what I think I hear you saying is that neurosemantics is a great way for a person who's got a high intelligence and IQ to really start going, hold on a second, this train does not have to keep hitting this wall. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Because who's driving the train? <laughs> right. <laughs> and, 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 the problem, <laughs> and the problem isn't that you're, you know, the problem, it's, it's an awesome thing that you're driving the train. It's just if you keep on driving into the wall, what that tells me as a neurosemanticist is that you're not operating off of a great map. That map keeps on leading you into that wall. And you don't want it to lead you into the wall, but that's the only map that you have. To stay within that metaphor, what we would do is say, is, is first of all, bring your awareness to your map that you're operating from. Because like I said before, that these, these thoughts about our thoughts and our whole model of the world typically is very unconscious to us. It happens so, we're so good at it. We're so skilled at thinking in that way that it just like pops out automatically. We don't even have to think about it. And it's that autopilot is operating off of a map that's leading us into the wall. So the first thing that we would do is just kind of bring your awareness so that you can become conscious of these unconscious patterns and say, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm the one driving the train. And this Art. is the map that I'm using. <laughs> Which is, it's, it's, it's amazing uh, thing to do because, and also to look at it non-judgmentally because a lot of times we beat ourselves up about it. We go, oh man, I can't believe I'm doing this again. I'm such an idiot. I'm so horrible. Everybody else is right about me. I'll never amount. All of that, that talk starts going off in the head. But the truth is, is that if I, you know, was operating, if I had that same map, I'd be running into the same wall. So the problem isn't you. The problem is just the map. Let's find some better maps that you can use to navigate more effectively. Well, that, that's really important. I'm glad you said that um, because the problem isn't the person. It is the map, you know, and I, I tell people a lot, if you keep working really hard toward a goal and you keep missing it, either sabotaging or something, it's not you. It's the goal. There's something wrong with the strategy or the picture. There's, it's, you know, and to get outside of that. And so I really like that because it really stops that, self-deprecating beating yourself up just really oh, I'm the whole most horrible person it has nothing to do with that it has to do with get the right tools for where you're going and use your brain to your betterment and use what you've got for your success and then all the results change you know mm -hmm. and um which to me is exciting as can be and like yes you know i think the world needs more of us who are gifted and visionary and talented really letting our potential explode out into the world to put some light out there um i know you're passionate about that too and i know we're getting close to the time um for the end of this interview and so before we leave i would like you to share a little bit about how you help people where people can reach you um, I believe you have an upcoming event coming up um, that I'm planning on coming to. And so kind of share with my audience a little bit about Jason and what Jason does and, and um, how you can serve some of the people that you are one of us and what you can do. Yeah, sure. So I guess uh, <clears throat> to get started, I can talk about the, the event we have coming up in March. Okay. So um, there's two there's two sides of how I work with people. One is that I coach them using the skills and tools and awarenesses that I have. And the other thing is that I teach people how to use this stuff in their own life with themselves and with the people that they communicate with. So I have a training coming up uh, March 2nd, 3rd, and 4th here in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, where I will be teaching. It's a three-day program teaching the essentials of neurolinguistic programming so that you can use it in your life with yourself kind of as a, as a self coach to have that, to build that self awareness in, to recognize the blind spots that you've been operating off of and bring your awareness to them and also build in the skills that you can use to shift those blind spots, to expand beyond them and to grow yourself into the next chapter, the next stage of your life. So giving you tools that you can use for the rest of your life to continually update your maps of the world. And so I have that coming up, that, that uh, three-day training. It's an, uh, a wonderful introduction to NLP, and I'm really excited to be teaching it uh, here in Fort Lauderdale. So it's a live event. We're going to get to be in your presence, and so I think that's a really powerful thing, um, right? It's live, right? 
Yeah, it's, it's not live. On, it's not electronic. It's not on um, yes. webinar. It's live and in person. And I think that's huge, the in-person part. And I've studied NLP and I'm still going. And you shared with me that there's a lot of changes and advances, that nothing's static, right? And so even if you've learned some NLP, um, this might be a neat thing to go get some of the updates and be refreshed and be reminded of what you know from somebody who's immersed in it all the time um, because it is changing and evolving. Nothing happens outside of time or space. So I just wanted to throw that out there so that if somebody's listening is not saying, well, you know, I've already done that. And I'm like, well, I've done it too. And I'm still going because things are evolving and changing. And, and it's that open-mindedness that pays off for all of us gifted people. Yeah. And, 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 and even beyond that is that, that I went to my NLP practitioner, master practitioner program about a dozen times. And every single time I went through, trust me, I saw things that I didn't see the first time because I'm learning things. So, so even the foundational stuff, um, you know, it's like you can never go back enough and enough and up and learn how to practice, uh, let's say, rather than learning because it's highly experiential, practice building relationships with people, practice communicating in ways that you haven't communicated before, practice setting goals for yourself in a way that's highly effective, practice reading people's nonverbal and <laughs> nonverbal communications and being able to adapt and adjust to them in the moment. So, so uh, even beyond just learning the new stuff and the updates, which are phenomenal, really just being able to continually practice, uh, practice, practice, because the training is, is 70, 80% experiential. Oh, that's amazing and awesome. And so you said there was more than one way you work with people. Do you do individual work with people or, or what would, what would happen if somebody said, you know, well, I don't want, I can't do a three day training or I don't want to do that, but I really want like to get somebody to help me with this. How are you available for that? So I work uh, one-to-one with people in a coaching, a coaching kind of mentoring type of um, relationship where, where we meet usually twice a month and uh, we'll work together to help you to either remove your blind spots, achieve the goals that you're working towards or some combination of the two. And so I do that type of work virtually and I do that all through application. So if someone wants to or is interested in that, they can go to my website uh, and apply for a, a, just a, a conversation where we can sit down, um, see how we how we fit together, what our relationship is, if I think that I can help you achieve what you want to achieve, or maybe I have a resource or someone else that can help you to do that, then um, that's the process for that. Well, that's great. And your website is? My website is perceptionacademy.com. Perfect. And, uh, there's a lot of a lot of great free resources there for people who want to just get started. Perfect. Perceptionacademy.com. And I will put those that information in the show notes so that you can research it and then go learn more about Jason and Perception Academy and neurolinguistic programming and neurosemantics and all the great things that really help gifted, talented people thrive. Now, is there anything that you would like to say as a closing remark or something that you kind of are inspired to say that if we stopped now, you'd be going, ah, wrong. (laughs) Well, I just want to say that, that I, you know, we've, we've gone over a lot of stuff just in this call alone. And, and if you just were to take action on one of the things that, that I or Diane have talked about today, I'd like you to think about what would be the one thing that you would like to hold on to and actually take action on in your life, whether it's thinking about things in a prototype mentality, accepting your fallibility as a human being, and as a mis- actually embracing yourself as a mistake maker so that you can fail fast and actually improve through your blind spots, whether it's um, recognizing when you're having a semantic reaction within yourself, when you're having a, this a strong response and when you actually come to your senses that there's actually nothing happening in the present moment in front of you, or, or whether it's just uh, going to my website or going to look up some more information that you can actually use to finding a coach or something that can help you to see beyond your blind spots. Um, you know, figure out what's the one thing that you're gonna do to actually make this real in your life and just take action on that one thing. And if you do that, then you'll, <laughs> you'll get a lot more results than listening to a million podcasts or watching a thousand videos. <laughs> That's great. I like a lot of people say knowledge is power. And I always say a- the application of the knowledge is the power. And so I encourage all of you take an action, let Jason or myself or both of us know what action you took 
and how it worked out for you because both of us are action takers, as you can tell. And so thank you very much, Jason, for your time, your attention, your expertise, your amazing insights. Um, you just made a great, great show for my listeners, and I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. All right. And so everybody, don't forget, keep your face toward the sun so the shadows fall behind you. And until the next time, keep smiling and practice what you're learning. Are you tired of searching for someone who understands you? Join our Facebook group, Someone Gets Me. In this group, you will be able to connect with others who are intense, sensitive, smart, talented, and wanting to be understood. Diane shares her insights and teachings, and you can connect with others. Join today.